This was such a good conversation with Monica Reinagel, a nutritionist and coach who is an absolute pro at nutrition and lifestyle behavior change. If you don't take pages and pages and pages of notes from this one, well, replay it again from the beginning and take notes. You'll put a lot of what Monica shares into practice with your clients right away. I know I did. She's a licensed board certified nutritionist with a master's of science in human nutrition. She's the host of the Change Academy and Nutrition Diva podcasts. She writes for Medium.com, Scientific American, Food and Nutrition Magazine, and she's a frequent health expert guest on shows like The Today Show, CBS News, and NPR's Morning Edition. She's a boss. Let's go. Hi, I'm Erin Power. And I'm Laura Rupsis. We're certified health coaches, and this is Health Coach Radio. This podcast is about the art, science, and business of health coaching. We share our insider tips to help you become a better coach and entrepreneur. And we interview expert guests to discover how they've made it in this growing field. It's time for health coaches to make an impact. It's time for Health Coach Radio. All right, Monica Reinangle, how are you? I'm so excited to be with you both today. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a few weeks now. We have too. We love talk and shop with all things health, nutrition, behavior change. Love it all. Um, And you've built a phenomenal business for yourself. So we can't wait to pick your brain. Well, it's always fun to speak to other coaches. You know, we spend so much of our time trying to figure out how we can reach the people that we're trying to help. And it's always fun to get behind the scenes with other people who are engaged in the same kinds of challenges and talk shop. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. So fill people in, give everyone your background story, like how you started down this path, uh, why you chose the path you chose and a little bit about where you are today. My training is in nutrition. So I came in through that route, Um, but I have been podcasting for 15 years now. I started the Nutrition Diva podcast way back in 2008 when I barely knew what a podcast was, right? Um, And love to go into the, the science of food and nutrition and unpack the studies and all of that. But after several years of talking about the science of nutrition, and working with people who wanted to improve their nutrition, I realized that the the science of helping people get a handle on their behaviors and make lasting behavior change was just a whole other field. So I, I kind of opened up my practice at that point and really started to focus on that aspect of it, which has very little to do with, you know, how much vitamin C is in an orange and <laughs> how much fiber is in broccoli. It's, you know, about the human brain. But that's where I feel like I've finally been able to have a bigger impact because most of the people that I was working with on improving their eating habits and their nutrition, they kind of knew what to do. They knew a lot about nutrition already. They were struggling to change their behavior, to be consistent in these new habits. And when I really started to work on that to develop my own skills uh, in helping people overcome those challenges and design programs and applications that would address those challenges. That's when things really got fun and really got exciting. Ooh, actually, you just phrased it in a way that I hadn't heard before. Mm -hmm. Um, Because we always talk about the difference between information and implementation. That's where the coach shines. Um, And the way we've kind of always heard it phrased slash we phrase it ourselves is like the information's readily out there. You can get it if you go to the bookstore or Google anything. But what you said is actually even more interesting, which is people already know what healthy eating is. Like (laughs) that's been drilled into their skulls. Mm -hmm. Like they get it, right? Mm -hmm. Also, some of those little granularities of nutrition science like are are not actionable, right? Like um, I always laugh when my clients will say things like, uh, does cream in my coffee break my fast? I'm like, you don't even know how to eat. Like what's the point of breaking your fast? So yeah. So the behavior change piece is like, that's the, that's the golden goose. That's what we are here to do. Right. So you made a shift from nutrition science to behavior change science. How did you facilitate that change yourself? Like, did you take additional education? How did you, or was this just learned through your client interactions? Well, I I didn't shift away from nutrition science. I still am very involved in that, but I kind of added this other piece. And yeah, I went back 
the way I was trained in nutrition science, I went to the literature, you know, the scientific literature and, you know, what are best practices? What's, what are the evidence-based approaches here? And, um, I was amazed to discover that this gap between people's intentions and their behaviors is so is such a thing that there's actually an entire scientific literature on it. They call it the the intention behavior gap. <laughs> And, you know, all kinds of studies. So there was plenty of raw material there and I just dug in, but then of course uh, it's about translating that into application. How do we actually put this into action with our clients in our programs? And, and I have, I was lucky enough to have a bunch of clients, a lot of uh, programs that I could um, refine with this information and see how it worked in real life. Um, So starts with the science, right? As any good practitioner will, but then ends in the real world. How is it actually happening? And, you know, I've, I've designed a lot of programs that I do with my own folks that I do for corporate wellness um, programming. I've designed a couple of smartphone apps. Um, and, and in all of this, I feel like I've kind of boiled it down to five key principles that I feel like any coach could kind of keep in the back of their mind as they are working with their clients or even kind of devising an approach or a program or something that can kind of keep us on track and keep us focused on the most important things. Ooh, I have a list of to know. Yes. Let's talk about those five <laughs> things. Can we start there? You know, I figured we'd get to that later, but since you brought it up, Well, you know, this is kind of the heart of it. And then once you have this, you can kind of overlay this over whatever you are designing or wherever it's going wrong and saying like, okay, what's missing here? What, what do I need to, what gap do I need to fill? Um, So you want to just run through them and we can kind of talk about how, how I apply them, how you apply them. um, Because I think they're pretty universal Mm -hmm. to nutrition, to, um, to fitness coaching, to health coaching, even other kinds of coaching, like, you know, productivity and time management. And, you know, it's, they're very universal. So the first one is that you need to instill confidence. That sounds obvious, but it's kind of tricky because in order to really commit and stay motivated to a process, people need to feel confident about two different things. And those two things are kind of in conflict with one another, are kind of intention. With one another. Mm-hmm. So first, they need to feel confident that what you're giving them to do is going to work. It's going to be effective. It's going to produce a benefit. But they also need to be confident that they can do it. Mm-hmm. And those two things kind of pull in opposite directions. So we need to kind of find that sweet spot between those things. So if you give somebody a program that's really challenging and really, and in the in the diet world is always like the more elaborate and complex it is, the more confidence they have that it's going to work or in fitness, you know, a really, really challenging regimen, like, oh, they're confident that it would work, but they start to lose confidence that they're good for it, that they can actually do it. And that turns out to be demotivating. But on the other hand, if you give them something that feels like for sure, I can do this, but I'm not sure it's really going to make much of a difference that's also demotivating. I'm not going to bother. So I think with coaches, as coaches, we're always looking for that, that sweet spot that is going to instill confidence that you can do this and this is worth doing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I, can I share an anecdote that kind of relates to that, that I think maybe coaches can, um, maybe relate to as well. I have this, I have this online course. It's my protocol and it's everything I know you know, squished into a course and it's like, (laughs) take my online course and people will buy it and learn everything I know. And there's implementation um, bits and pieces in there as well. Um, One time I, you know, I was thinking of like, how can I optimize this, this sort of in, you know, in a manner of speaking, this passive income stream, because it's literally a do it yourself online course. There's no coaching involved. It's kind of a nice little thing to have in your, in your roster of programs. Mm -hmm. And I ran a report and found that everybody who bought that course, the average completion was something like 20%. People, like people mm. were getting 20, on average, people were getting about 20% of the way through the course before they dropped off. Wow. So that's not good. <laughs> 
So I, I started chopping, 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 take this out. This is not necessary. This is overwhelming. This is too much. Let's, let's bring it back to brass tacks. So I actually simplified, made the program less, less overwhelming. And now more people buy it and more people get through it. You could probably also raise the price. <laughs> could, raise the, could raise the price. But I think what you said was so interesting and I jotted it down. What you said is like, we feel like we have to word vomit everything we know. Right that we need to give people information. I'm smart. I learned this. I know all this. I'm going to impart to you my wisdom, dear client, but that's, that's overwhelming and overwhelm is demotivating. Um, so that, that was just, that made me think, think, but your, your point is there's actually this kind of, there's these, this tension, this friction between we can't overwhelm them. But we also can't like really underwhelm them. Right. We have to land in this happy spot in the middle. Well, I want to just put a little finer point on that because you're right. We can't, underwhelm or overwhelm people, but that actually starts to touch on a second of my key principles. So I want to differentiate here. This is about over challenging mm. or under challenging. Mm -hmm. You know, this is really, you're 100% right about that overwhelm. But before we leave this point, I want to just, you know, make sure we've really hit this. This is about confidence. Mm -hmm. And this goes to self-efficacy. You know, if people don't feel, oh, now I'm back in the literature, right? If people don't feel that self-efficacy, they won't take action. They won't stick to things, but that self-efficacy has those two pieces, yeah. confidence that it will work, confidence that I can do it. So maybe we can just differentiate between those two. There's also that other tension for sure. I love that you've done the research and jumped into the science. We teach, we teach the science of self-efficacy in our master coach course. And um, it's a real aha for coaches that take that course, that our goal is to have the client believe that they have the knowledge, tools, and resources to do it themselves and that it's going to work. Like that's, that's our, our goal in the program. Cool. Yes. And for clients, as opposed to when we're working with coaches, when we're coaching coaches, when we're coaching individuals, the, the thing that's hardest for them to get isn't the knowledge, isn't the tools, it's the resources. And what we really mean by that is internal resources. Mm -hmm. right? And that's where we often really need to help them build up their, their confidence that they can, because they usually have a, a long string of failed attempts in their, in their rear view mirror. Right. So that is often where their biggest doubt is that they kind of have quote unquote, what it takes, you know, and that's not about knowledge and it's not about a tool. It's that internal resource piece. Yeah. But to your point about the overwhelming, the, the second one of my five little, uh, not little big <laughs> my five key principles is to reduce complexity for exactly the reason that you just said. And, but what, but what you touched on, I think is um, an error that, that we as coaches often fall into. And that is we want to show our worth and we want to show our value. And the way we do that is to load people up with more information and more ideas. And what we really need to do is help them focus on the things that they most need and not confuse them, not overwhelm them, not clutter the field with, with a lot of information that's not, because as you say, it does get really demotivating. And what I've noticed is that, again, thinking about the, the end client, mm -hmm. behavior change is difficult. It takes a certain amount of cognitive bandwidth and energy and so if then we lay on, we layer on all of this other information and details and stuff, it quickly exhausts that remaining bandwidth and they just get burned out. So acknowledging that they're already, these are smart people, right? And they're motivated, but they're using a certain part of their capacity just to engage in this process of behavior change and habit change and habit formation. And sometimes I think what's left over to absorb information is less than we realize. Yeah. So we really want to help them focus on the things that are going to make the biggest difference. Otherwise, like you said, they're fine tuning before they even have the big pieces in place right. because they may not really recognize the hierarchy of how they want to go about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think this notion is part of why I'm seeing a trend that bothers me a little bit, but I'm, I'm finding more and more people going to market as health coaches that aren't really coaching. What they're doing is 
providing something that reduces complexity, like a bunch of, this is classic Weight Watchers. You don't have to learn how to cook or figure out how to balance a meal. All you got to do is buy ours. Mm -hmm. I've had about three conversations in the last two weeks with people that, um, I I don't want to say the company name, but they are people that wanted to become a health coach. They were told that they would be a health coach with this program, but now what they have to actually do is sell that program and sell those foods Mm -hmm. in order to be a coach with that program. And they're, you know, and so they're, they're going, it reduces complexity for sure. It makes it easy, but now I don't feel like I'm coaching, you know? So I would love for you to maybe expound on that a little bit in terms of, in terms of reducing complexity. Can you share an example of what that might look like from an actual coaching perspective. Yeah. And and that's an interesting example that you gave, but here's an example that, that I came up with. I wanted to give my people something that would give them some awareness and some accountability and some assessment about their diet, about their eating habits without them having to log every single thing they ate into my fitness pal or whatever, because that is tedious and time consuming. And you then get overwhelmed with information, like which one of those data points are are we supposed to be paying attention to, but there's value, right? There is some value in tracking. So instead of that, I came up with a set of 10 yes or no questions that you can answer about what you ate that day. It takes about a minute, right? You do it at the end of the day. And based on those 10 questions, you get a grade for the day. Just give you a quick read on like, well, how did I do? You know, did I, did I hit all the points, you know, did, and you can, and my goal for them was to give them fewer things to focus on and to help them focus on the things that were going to have the biggest impact on their overall nutrition, nutrient intake and risk factors, and just the overall quality of their diets. I just wanted to give them a handful of things to focus on. On my side, the challenge was definitely like, okay, I've got 10 questions. I better spend these wisely, Mm -hmm. right? I don't want to waste time asking about things that aren't actually that impactful or that always end up on the list of things that, for instance, I do not ask them whether they had eight glasses of water (gasps) because I don't think it matters. So, so I really had to look to see what foods and food groups are most consistently and strongly associated with overall dietary patterns, nutrient intakes, disease outcomes, and stick to those trusting that if I could get them focused on the right handful of things, a lot of that other stuff was going to kind of fall into place on its own. And they were going to have a much lower risk of overwhelm and burnout and forget it. This is just too hard Mm -hmm. because anybody can answer 10 yes or no questions Mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Mm, thank you. So thank you so much for that example, because this is again, just me, the, the role that I play at our school, helping coaches understand, um, you know, the path to making something easier, um, more, less complex is definitely reducing complexity is definitely a better term. And that th- there's a lot of people that I'm seeing now going to business, going that road, because they think that's going to be easier. I now have something to sell this product mm. that I'm selling people. And thus, I, it'll be easier for me to go to business. And they're now finding that that's not true. Well, right. It not work that way. Doing a good job reducing complexity for our clients doesn't actually reduce the complexity for us. It's a higher level of yeah. you know, investment and expertise that we have to bring to that in order to reduce the complexity because it, it has to be done intelligently mm-hmm. you know, and flexibly. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. What, what I like about the, the 10 question approach is that it's it's the subjective experience versus the the purely objective in a lot of, in a lot of cases not always right um not knowing what the 10 questions are and we don't have to you don't have to give us your 10 questions but just i'm thinking through this from the perspective of a, an app that we made a coaching app that we made where it was like we have this opportunity to collect data we can collect things like grams of carbohydrate consumed grams mm-hmm. of protein consumed grams of fiber we can you know we can track water intake we can track weight and it was like eh, i don't know there's already a million apps that do that so it's sort of like, let's get them ranking on a scale of one to five, how they executed this thing. Yes. On a scale of one to five, how does this feel? On a scale of one to five, how did you do with that general concept? Mm-hmm. Because the the piece to like, we talked earlier about evidence, the evidence-based approach, which is we have the science, 
there's a trifecta, right? We have the science, we have the clinical experience, and then we have the lived experience of the end user. Those are the three things that create the evidence-based approach. And, and I find like coaches and the, and the health industry in general is so data focused and data point, but like quantification oriented, the quantified self that the human, the lived experience of the human is being like ignored. But like that, that to me is when they, when the human graduates out of your care as out of your coaching relationship, they have to go off and live their human life and they may or may not be connected to data trackers like ever again. Right. right. So I love that. That's a really cool. I, I would just hope that more coaches will, will think through maybe getting the, the client to quantify their experience of executing. Yeah. And I love the example that you just gave because it invites them to think about the process and the concept and not only the outcome. And we know that that's where we want the focus. You know, what steps am I taking and how is this affecting me? Not necessarily like which bells did I ring? Which boxes did I check? Yeah, yeah nice. absolutely. That's cool. When I first met Erica, she was a skilled health coach who couldn't seem to make the leap from her nine to five job to a full-time coaching business. She was struggling to find clients and to identify what made her unique as a coach. Well, I've met tons of health coaches in that exact predicament, which is why I partnered with Primal Health Coach Institute to develop the Launch Your Coaching Business program. This course is specifically designed to help you hone your niche and graduate with a sure to sell product. Erica enrolled and created an awesome specialty program that brought in so many clients and so much passive income that she was eventually able to tiptoe into full-time health coaching. This course includes 12 weeks of live hands-on workshops with me, Primal Health Coach Institute Coaching Director Erin Power, and my co-teacher, best-selling author and coach Liana Werner-Gray. It also includes an online course that helps you get clear on your specialty, know exactly what your client wants and needs, and then create a program to meet those needs. Then comes the practical how-to for getting that product out into the world and into the hands of the people who need it and who need you. We keep the class small so you get the high-touch support and guidance you need to get your product to market fast. If you are ready to get your health coaching business off the ground, visit primalhealthcoach.com to learn more about the Launch Your Coaching Business course. Okay, we're on to number three. Mm -hmm. Okay. Number three is to balance the do's with the don'ts. So in nutrition, this is obvious. There's always this long list of things that we want people to limit or restrict or avoid for their own good, you know, and we want to also tell them, of course, what we want them to eat more of and include more of in their diet, because it's just more fun right. to think about the things that we want to add and increase um, in a way that we enjoy, then it is to only think about those things that we're going to limit or remove. But I can think of examples in the, in the fitness and movement world too. We don't want to tell them just don't sit for eight hours at a time. Don't be too sedentary. You know, what can we give them that, that to do that results in them not being sedentary and sitting for eight hours at a time. So this is a pretty simple principle of just making sure that we're balancing the positives with the negatives, just because it is more engaging and it's more fun. So to pick up on that last example, my 10 questions, five are on eating patterns and habits that we want to encourage. And five are on habits that we want to monitor. I won't say eliminate or avoid, but we want to make sure we're not overdoing those. So it's that kind of balance, you know, the five positives and the five, we call them watch out for us, you know, not necessarily negatives, but you know, watch out for those, right. um, to, to have that balance between do's and don'ts. Mm -hmm. Love it. Um, I was thinking about, uh, I'd gone to, um, to see a speaker talk like a motivational, I don't know, life coach type of speaker anyway. She gave this really great example of how when she was raising her kid, no, when she was raised, her parents raised her never using, ra rarely using the word don't or that kind of don't energy, rarely. Like occasionally you have to tell your kid, okay, don't do that. But <laughs> for example, the example she gave, which I thought was awesome was when, you know, she was carrying a, a glass of milk to the table for dinner. She was a little kid and the glass is full right to the top because that's how kids fill their milk glass right to the top. <laughs> right? So she's carrying it to the table. And instead of saying, okay, don't spill that, her parents said, 
okay, take really careful steps. Okay. Now lift it up a little higher, like explaining how to do the carrying of the milk rather than, oh, don't spill. Like just that little language shift. I just thought was so interesting because like a lot of clients, um, I've had clients literally tell, literally tell me they don't want to do the things I'm asking them to do. And when I say why I've had a client say petulance, I just don't want to (laughs) the rebel, right? (laughs) Right, That rebel archetype. So Telling that person, don't, 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 they're going to be like, oh yeah, come at me. <laughs> Watch me. So I just think that that's such an interesting language shift. It's hard though. It's, it's, it's really hard. I think, I don't know why it's so hard. Maybe you know why it's so hard for us to rearrange our language in that way. Well, it's a, it's a great challenge to think what mm, prohibition or prescription can I phrase in the positive, yeah. but just, I don't know, let's, Let's think this through together, right? If we only tell people do this, do this, do this, do this, at least in my world, what happens is I have people who are struggling with their weight and they can't figure out why. And they give me a list of all of the healthy foods that they're eating. And, you know, and there's this disconnect between, um, right. You, it's possible to overeat healthy foods, right? It's possible to, um, to eat for reasons that have nothing to do with hunger and, you know, all of that comes into it. So you can have, you know, be doing a great job eating all the healthy foods and still be having some challenges with getting the results that you want. Oh, yeah. And, and so I think sometimes it is necessary to identify behaviors that are not serving us yeah. and to decide that we want to take action to, to change those things. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. Could every single one of them be phrased in a positive maybe, but maybe it's also okay. Cause we're not four-year-olds anymore. Right. right. Uh, we are grownups. And so maybe it is okay to say like, these are some things I want to make sure to do. And right. these are some things that I don't want to do so much of, right. you know, and to, and to name that. Yeah. As a personal development tool, I think the stop doing list has been, um, popularized in recent years, you know, like you get this to-do list, but also like the stop doing, like stop, stop mindlessly scrolling, stop spending ridiculous money on on Amazon and stupid things you don't need. Like there, there's, there's development to be made by acknowledging things that we can stop doing. Well, otherwise it's just so additive. You just keep adding, 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 right. And it is worth, uh, you know, going through your closet and deciding what you're not wearing anymore (laughs) or yeah, or what behavior, what habit, is dragging you down either because it's taking up too much of your time or your mental energy or creating any other kind of unwanted consequence and deciding like, yeah, I'm going to do less of that. I think what I've seen, Erin, is the do more of, do less of. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's a nod towards the don't say don't. <laughs> right. There we go. I'll call it the replacement theory. You know, if there if there's a, a behavior that you are trying to remove, that's hard to remove, let's think through how we can replace it with something else. So like, and one example, just this past Halloween, I sent just a little message to every single one of my clients. Hey, little reminder, eat dinner before you take your kids Halloween can't, you know, Mm -hmm. trick or treating, Mm -hmm. you know, pro tip. If you are not hungry when you're surrounded by all that candy, you're going to be either less likely to eat it or you'll eat less of it. Right. You know, trying to give them something to do to focus on that would be positive and, and nurturing of themselves rather than just now, don't forget, you know, it takes 50 burpees to work off one of those little Snickers. You know? <laughs> so. Well, and to your point, um, one of the feedback I've had, I don't know, two or 3000 people use this app and do this program with me. And one of the things that I hear back from them most frequently is that when they focus on those five positives, they find that they don't have their plates are full, their snacks are taken care of. They've, and there, and there's just not as much room yep. in their life or their meal plan or, or their stomach for those things that are on the, you know, not so much of list so that it's easy to say at the end of the day is like, yeah, actually I didn't have any of that, yeah. you know, but that it's a result. It's a net effect of prioritizing those things that they want to make sure that they are including. Mm-hmm. Love it. People get really excited about that too. Mm-hmm. Uh, Laura, I've heard you describe it as the crowding out theory. Yeah. But yes. like I use it with my clients as well. It's like, it's like, listen, you don't have to get rid of the Oreos in the pantry. Let's just set up an environment where you can peacefully coexist with them because they're not calling to you because you're adequately nourished. And people get really excited. Like, wow, I like the last three days, I didn't sneak into the pantry for a bunch of Oreos. Like, wow, we didn't. We didn't, uh, it wasn't, wasn't a slapping wrists every time you have an Oreo. It was just right. making different decisions such that the Oreos weren't a 
a factor. I always throw Oreos under the bus. I need to find a new scapegoat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I like that. The crowding out. Yeah. We talk about displacement, you know, yeah. that, or yeah. I think you said replacement. Did you say displacement? I mean, I said replacement, you. but Aaron's yeah. right. That's the term I use. So we're going to crowd out all the crap by making yeah. sure we are overloading all this good stuff. And, and so that's what I, I'm like, look, I'm not telling you, you can't have the ice cream. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying, eat all this first. Right. And I typically find in the beginning, a lot of people kind of still eat the ice cream in the beginning. Mm-hmm. It just, that portion gets smaller and smaller and they eventually yes. don't want it anymore. That's because that's it is an incremental process. Mm-hmm. And, and I feel like the more incremental those changes are, the more likely they are to be long-term shifts as opposed to some, you know, big effort that they make to please their coach or to, you know, in this program that they're doing or something, but yeah, those little incremental things I feel are so much stickier and so much more valuable. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So balance the do's and the don'ts. What's next? Okay. So my next one is to counter perfectionism. I know we all struggle to, um, to keep our folks focused on progress and not perfection and not to let the, whatever the lack of perfection be an excuse to, to stop working towards improvement, you know, but it just, we could, we're never done, you know, um, reinforcing that message and trying to build it in to our languaging, to our messaging, to our programming. So for example, uh, this app that I, with the 10 questions, we use it in a 30 day challenge program that people use in the, and the object of the challenge is just to improve your eating habits, Mm -hmm. right? It's really just a nudgy, nudgy kind of program for eating habits. So you're getting a grade every day, right? But the, but the goal is to finish the 30 days with a grade point average of B. Oh, like yeah. that's, that's the goal B anywhere in that B range to me. And, you know, I can't sustain it. I can get an A or an A plus on any given day. I certainly couldn't have a running average of A's. And, you know, I, I don't know many people who could, yep. But I just start from day one saying like, look, you finished with a B here. That tells me that you're hitting enough of those healthy habits consistently enough that you're actually getting the benefits from them Mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, the one day when you did them all and that was it. Mm -hmm. And in order to be in that B range, you know, you will have to um, have not been overindulging in too many of those things too often. There's kind of no other way to do it, but it leaves so much room for the lack of profession, per, perfection. Um, so first of all, yeah, just finishing with a B is not perfect, but in a 30 day grade point average, there's room for some F days and they happen. Mm-hmm. And it's not a reason to quit, you know, mm-hmm. or to th- throw in the towel. It's like, Oh, it was one day, but I'm still, I got my eye on the prize. I'm trying to finish with a B. <laughs> so where it's, it's definitely like the land of the good enough. It's funny that you call it F days because that's when people say F it. <laughs> um, it's so, I just love this so much. This makes me really excited. And like the B grade thing is so cool because it, um, it sort of, it sort of embodies this 80, 20 principle that is kind of over overused, but, but same idea. Mm-hmm. Um, I was thinking of a client who I just signed up and I, I drive home this point of perfection as well. And I've said point blank it's not working for you. It literally perfection isn't working. So let's just try something completely different. Uh, If nothing changes, nothing changes. Right. So this guy I was working with when I was doing the discovery call before he enrolled, we were talking, talking about him and, and he said, you know, I really, I really do better with like an all or nothing approach. I'm kind of an all or nothing guy that hundred percent, I'm good at hundred percent, anything less than hundred percent. It just doesn't work for me. I'm like, does it work though? Like (laughs) if it was working, if 100% compliance and being all in was working, we we literally wouldn't be having this conversation. You know, I think people think it's working or they, I wonder if you know, or if we can maybe brainstorm, why are people so driven to this perfection, all or nothing, black and white thing with food specifically with, with, with health? Because I don't think people put that pressure on themselves for anything else. You know, I would be interesting to ask somebody who says, I just want to, it's a hundred percent for me or nothing. And that works for me. What percentage of their time they spend being 100% on board? Like what percentage of the last 12 months Mm -hmm. have you been all in, you know? And if it's like, well, two out of the last 12 months, it's like, okay, so that's not a hundred percent. That's 18%. (laughs) Right. Right. (laughs) Right. What would happen if we got that up to 33%, you know? 
And we could do that by, you know, getting you a hundred percent one with a third month of the year, you know, or we could get you to that. I mean, if they want to get mathy, we can get mathy. Yeah. Let's right? go with the math. That's a good point. <laughs> You know, but for those hundred percent people, it's like, yeah, but what percentage of your time do you spend in that state? And even if it's working great during that percentage of the time, I think when we look at the big picture, yeah, it's, it's, you could do better for it's yourself. Only, it's only right? working. Really- yeah. It's only working when it's working. And then like when it's, when it's not working at hundred percent, like that pendulum swings right to zero. Nobody's well, looking at right, those times when it's not working. It's right. like, you're still in your body. You're still in your life. All that still counts. Yeah. And of course, that's when we stop tracking. We stop using our habit trackers. We stop because now we're not on the program, right? Mm-hmm. But all of those days, they still add up to your results. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you know. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I get a little hot and bothered about that. No, but, but you know, it's, you know, it's funny because my so back poor Brad, Aaron. <laughs> so my poor husband, Brad. he goes from like being really excited and one hundred percent. He's a prime example of this. One hundred percent on board with something. And he's good for like a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And then one thing about whatever environment was helping him be successful there. So prime example of this, he was doing really, really well for a few weeks. And then he went on a camping trip with his buddies and all just, it all went to hell. And he has had a really hard time getting back on track. And he talked, he tells me I'm much better with rigidity and rules and blah, blah, blah. And what I'm saying is it's not the rules, it's the principles that you can take and translate to any environment, right? Those rules that you are keep telling me you need to adhere to are only relevant and doable in one environment. That's not going to like when you're at home with me and I'm cooking all your meals and everything is, you know, he's my husband, I'm his wife. I can't coach him. He's seeing somebody else. Right. But at the same time, it's like, you've got to forgive yourself learn from it. Okay. What was it about the camping trip that sent me off into a tailspin so that Mm -hmm. the next time you go on a camping trip, you can avoid that. Well, this kind of leads us into my fifth principle. Okay, And that is, it's like we planned it, right? (laughs) Um, And that is to focus on the means and not the extremes. Because, and maybe this starts to get at what you were asking a minute ago, Aaron, why are we so, you know, all or nothing black and white, you know, our brains are actually hardwired to pay more attention to extreme things. We remember, you know, our most extreme behaviors, positive or negative, they, they stand out in our memory. We remember them. We tend to forget all the typical days. We don't remember them and we underweight we, we underestimate their impact. And then at the same time, we're overestimating the impact for better, or for worse of those super extreme behaviors. Right. And I think that's why when you go camping and the whole thing, you know, falls apart, there's that tendency to overestimate the impact of that on the long-term trajectory. So every app and program I've ever designed goes heavy on the, I'm a big fan of the moving average right? And the trend line. And if I can take away individual data points and replace them just with a slant, like, are we moving? Which way are we headed here? (laughs) Um, You know, I will do it. Um, And that's kind of the whole concept between the Nutrition GPA app is that we don't care about your grade on any one day. We're we're interested in your nutrition GPA, your grade point average. And what people see when they use that over time is, yeah, they have the camping trip happens And that two days is a little messy. And that seven day trend is not great. But then you back it out to 30 days or you back it out to six months. You'd be like, it's a blip. It was nothing. And, and the faster I get back into my habits, the less of an impact that little blip will have on that overall grade point average. And we all know grade point averages from school, right? So it's a convenient little thing. Here's an interesting thing. People who use the nutrition GPA will often ask if they can have their histories erased because they want to start fresh. Oh my gosh, hmm. how funny. And we 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 have no function in the app that allows you to erase your history, but I know how strong an impulse it is. People get away from it. It's like, you know what? I'm going to get back into the nutrition GPA, but I want a blank slate. I want a clean slate. <laughs> and I and I want to start again. 
Um, and we don't do it and it's intentional. I mean, that's an easy function to build into an app. We don't do it because we really want them to reconcile themselves to the fact that even when they turn the page and it's January 1st or it's Monday morning or it's whatever it is, they're still dragging their entire history behind them. And that's not as bad as they think. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it works that, that positive momentum can also work for them to power them over those little bumps in the road, those little blips, when you have that long history and you can see how it, it in context, when you can contextualize those yeah. flame out moments kind of takes the power out of them. Right. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And it also keeps people from getting too chuffed because they had one amazing day. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I've heard that said, um, one skipped workout doesn't make you any worse of a person. Wait, how does it go? One skipped workout doesn't mean you're a bad person any more than one salad for lunch makes you a good person. Kind of these little, we really do have this sort of like very granular view of how. how exactly. And by extension, like one skipped workout does not tank your fitness any more than one salad for lunch solves your, your, your nutrition needs, you know? Right. Yeah. So we do focus in. Um, on individual events. And then we magnify the impact of our best and worst behaviors. It's so distorting mm -hmm. and it's so distorted. The only way I know how to counter that is to train people's attention onto, you know, to give them mechanisms by which they can see the longer term impact and the cumulative impact of their choices mm -hmm and get them out of that one day, that one hour and try to get them out of that habit of saying like, okay, well, you know, it's, it's 3 PM on Saturday, the weekend's obviously shot. I'm just going to regroup on Monday morning or, you know, that waiting for the, the new thing, the new month, the new week, the new day to start over when it can be enormously empowering to realize it's 3 PM. And you know what? I can actually turn this, the trajectory of this day around right now, you could do that at 9 PM. That's right. That's right. hundred percent. Your next meal. Yeah. Um, it's so funny. I wonder, I think it's so interesting how people are, um, it takes them a while to appreciate trend lines. So we had a fellow on the podcast a little while ago. His name is Jordan Syatt. He's a well-known fitness influencer guy, and he's currently doing a little mini cut. He's on a little bit of a diet. He's a, he's a caloric deficit guy. That's his thing. He's like caloric deficit. Anyways, whatever. So he did this little minor, very livable caloric deficit, very, very easy to live with just to kind of show his followers, like, I'm going to do that. I'm going to try to lose 20 pounds and I'm just doing this really manageable caloric deficit. He's plotting his weight every single day on a graph and his graph that he uses in his own app has the data points. And then it has the trend line, which I think a lot of these apps have. So <laughs> there's a period of time every couple of weeks or so where he plateaus right? Because that's how weight loss works. Goes down, goes down, goes up a little bit, goes down, then it plateaus for a few days and does it again. That's literally how fat loss works. And, but he's showing his trend line. It's going down. He's having, he's having a lovely time. He's not deprived. Anyway, every single time he hits one of these plateaus, his DMs explode apparently with people who are like, I don't know how you keep going. I would have quit. <laughs> oh, and it's like, because of two days in a yeah, row, then nothing happened. not working anymore. And he, right. he, now he's a very brash person, which I love. He's like, keep effing going. This is why you keep screwing up because you always quit when it's, you know, he's a little bit with the tough love, but it's really true. Like, it's like, that's not working, throw in the towel. And I wonder why that is. And so I wonder, and this leads me to a question I'm just curious about because I'm getting a sense that maybe this is on your, on your radar, but I wonder if like the self-compassion research made it onto your research radar at all. The research around like the, 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 what do they call it? The shared almost struggle of the human experience. And that's part of how we go through life just, just with the struggle and making friends with the struggle and acknowledging I would have thrown in the towel then, you know, why is that? Like, what about the human experience? Like, do, do you ever, do you dive into the self-compassion research at all? Is that on your radar? Well, we're certainly have our hands in it constantly sure. with our clients, right? Because, um, because they are so hard on themselves mm -hmm. and um, it's very difficult for them to look at a lapse or a, a mistake or, or a setback with anything other than, you know, self-loathing and self-recrimination. And, um, mm -hmm. 
you know, we say it till it's we're blue in the face. And sometimes the best things we can do, the best thing we can do is to model it for them. You know, when we um, hit a setback or a lapse or something, and to try to display what that looks like to have, you know, compassionate curiosity about what happened there. But we do somehow believe that we can hate ourselves healthy and that if we are harsher with ourselves, it will be motivating. Like, well, I'm certainly not going to do that again because I've just given myself a big bucket of negative self, you know, negative reinforcement, but it doesn't seem to work that way. It actually seems to work the the other way. So mm-hmm. you're right that our ability to, to view our behavior with curiosity, with compassion, to accept ourselves as works in progress um, is it's very challenging. It's challenging, I think, for us as individuals and, you know, each of us coaches are individuals, right? Working on our own stuff. It's hard for us. It's hard for us to teach. It's hard for us to model. But in that example that you were just giving though, I still think that there's a problem before we even get to, you know, what sort of feelings do we want to have about it? There's a data interpretation problem there. And that is when that, what I see when I get, we really like to have our people who are working on weight management weigh themselves because that way we know whether what we're doing works and we get, this is touchy for people. People feel triggered and they feel like it's, you know, it's too much emphasis on the wrong thing. And it's like, well, it's not the only thing that we're going to focus on, but we do think it's a meaningful, it's the easiest way. We can't throw you in a DEXA scanner once a week, you know, but so we want them on the scale regularly just so we can see what's happening, but we have a really hard time convincing them that what they see on the scale today does not reflect whether you did a good or bad job yesterday. Right. We think that it's instant feedback. It's not like the feedback loop is more like 10 to 14 days that you're seeing the actual impact for better or for worse of the choices that you are making. But, you know, if you, you know, hit it out of the park yesterday, you had salad, you had like a black bean burger, you ate a lot of fiber, you know, blah, blah, blah. You got a lot of extra Mm -hmm. waste on board that hasn't yet been eliminated. You, you could be up a couple of pounds um, that has nothing to do with mm-hmm. whether or not you made good or bad choices or fat loss or fat gain or anything like that. It's just a transient, you know, situation, but it is really hard to convince people that today's weight is not a referendum on yesterday's behavior. Right. I yeah. think this comes up. This reminds me of like Thanksgiving dinner. Oh my gosh. I ate so much. I gained like three pounds. I'm like, <laughs> I've got great news for you. That's biologically impossible. You did not gain three pounds <laughs> yesterday. And people well, are like three pounds of fat. Anyway. No, right, right, right. Exactly. And, and like, when you put it that way, which just you know, I do it with some jovial energy. People are like, well, I know, I guess you're right. Like people know that on some level. On some level, I think they know. Well, here, maybe the trend line is our friend, right? Because you see that dot jump up mm-hmm. or jump down, mm-hmm. right? Um, and But then you see the, the the larger context of the trend line. It can, mm-hmm. at least we we hope that it helps people not overinterpret yeah. the the significance of those day-to-day fluctuations because they are so insignificant. They really are. You know, I love, I love, trackers that can track things that are actionable, that are representations of your choice, your own choices too. And, and here's the thing, and this is like true for so many of the women that I work with that I, how many, there are a lot of women I've worked with that by the end of the 12 weeks I'm done, the actual amount of weight and pounds they lost was not nearly where they wanted to go, but they're down two or three pant sizes. Right. You know, so for women in particular, the scale I agree with you. It's, it's a data point and it, they're lower than they were, but they had in their minds, they wanted to lose X amount of weight. Yep. But what they found at the end of the day, they look slimmer. They look healthier. You know what it is? They're no longer puffy. So many of these women are no longer puffy. Um, and they've lost like five pounds, but they look like they lost 10. Yep. You know, um, this is very, a very common thing with women. So I, I think in terms of tracking it's, you know, this is a data point. And we want to kind of know where we are, but we can use that data point to say, okay, in, you know, in my mind, I only lost five pounds, but I'm down two. Pa- like what, what other subjective things can we sort of track? Cause I am hearing from people, they find that tracking things, it does to a certain degree, hold them accountable. I think the trend line is a great idea, but also just tracking their own behaviors and tracking their own choices. 
Yeah. It's not it either actual. or. Yeah. I think, I think there's room for both, but let me add something to that phenomenon. We see it all the time in yeah. our books too, that they come in. It's not just women. Actually, I see this with the guys too, with a number in their head that represents success. Yeah. And who knows what they always seem to end in zero and five, right? <laughs> so there's, the, I'm suspicious of that right off the, yeah. right off the bat. But many times it's a number that has some sort of relevance in their history. You know, that's, it was what they weighed at a good point in their life or something, you know, where it just feels like, and that's their number that, and, and we start trying to like unclench their fingers from around that number, like on day one, like we can be like, I'm not there yet. And I can, and I'm moving toward, I can see my trend line. I'm moving in the right direction, but let's not put a number on the destination because we have come to think of your, um, I'll put it in air quotes for listeners your ideal weight as actually having three essential components, only one of which has to do with a number. So number one is it's a weight at which you are not at any um, increased health risks because of your Mm -hmm. weight or your body size, right? Number two, you're happy with the way your body looks, feels, and functions. And that goes to your point, Laura, like, how do I look at my genes? You know, how does it feel to be carrying my body up, up this hill. I want to hike this trail. I want to hike. So are you happy with the way your body looks, feels, and functions? That's almost never about a number that can be about fitness and body composition. It can also be about, um, something, you know, a number that we have in our head that we have to shift our relationship to. And then the third piece of, we're still not done. (laughs) So healthy weight, happy with the way your body looks, feels, and functions. The third piece is content in the habits and the lifestyle that it takes to keep you there. That's right. So sometimes we can get people to those first two, but they're white knuckling it. It's like, nope, I'm not done yet. We need to get you to the point where you're also really content in the lifestyle, in the day to day until we've got all three of those things aligned. You're not at your ideal weight. Right. I think that there's useful like utility there for coaches. I, that's a question I literally ask clients when they, when their goal is fat loss. Um, I, I always frame it as fat loss. I'm trying to change the narrative a little bit, but anyway, uh, I say, okay, so you probably have a goal weight in mind. What is it? And to your point, it's always 130, never 132, <laughs> <laughs> whatever it is. And I'll literally say, when was the last time you were at that weight? And they'll tell me when that was. And so I'll ask, you know, that was usually like, it was in my, before I had kids, when I was in my late twenties, it was like, life was generally easier then. So there's that. And then I will literally ask, did you find it relatively easy to maintain? And oftentimes it was, well, no, I was just exercising a lot. And I was really on top of my food all the time. And I was really like into it. And they're telling the story of when they were, when they were, um, sort of mired in micromanagement and it's Mm -hmm. not easy to maintain and hearing themselves say that. And then when we reflect it back as coaches do, they can hear that this weight that I'm aiming for this, this random number, it came from a time in my life when life was easier and I had more bandwidth maybe to Mm -hmm. fixate on my diet and exercise and it, but it wasn't easy and it wasn't joyful. And I, and then people automatically start negotiating on their own number. Well, actually, you know, if I can get back into my size eights, that would be great. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, it's like, okay, size eight. (laughs) Right. Right. So anyway, it's just, I think people go through life dieting and, and micromanaging, don't get me started on this, but like micromanaging, they've been kind of programmed to micromanage and obsess and be perfectionist and all the stuff we've talked about. And our, our, I think one of our big jobs as coaches is to non-judgmentally and with pure curiosity, just seek to understand where our clients' ideas of these things have come from. Yeah. What that goal actually represents or stands in for. What is it that they're trying to create or recreate by hitting that number or, or whatever it is? Cause sometimes that can be really revealing, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I, I want, I'm hoping coaches listening can take some confidence in knowing that everything we're talking about has nothing to do with a meal plan you necessarily put people on or a specific diet they had to follow or anything like that. Like everything we're talking about in terms of what you said was a game changer, right? This notion that people pretty much kind of know what they need to eat, right? Um, That it was this focus on the behaviors and trying to understand 
why change is so hard. That was such a game changer for you. And folks, I don't care where you live on this planet. I don't care what the local laws are, where you live as it relates to nutrition advice, everything related to behavior change is well within the wheelhouse of a health coach. Barring that we're not trying to like dabble in like therapy, Mm -hmm. you know, we're not, we're not clinical therapists or anything like that. So you know, bear that in mind. But in terms of these tools that you're talking about, these five things, these are all legal anywhere in the world. And by the way, the most important, that's what you said. These are the most important things that help actually like motivate and actually uh, make change happen are these five things. That's right. Features, features that you can apply those to, you know, whatever your field of practice is, but yeah, I think they're kind of the underlying tenets that we need to be looking for. Yeah. And you will find very few of them in, you know, the latest best-selling diet book or the latest, you know, mm-hmm. exercise YouTube channel, you know, which is, which is why health coaching is a thing, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. 100%. it is a thing. Wow. You gave us so much here. Um, I'm just personally grateful for the work you've done in, you know, I love this approach as this sort of nutrition GPA. It's a um, lot of fun. It is like you've, you just done such a great job of like cleanly articulating um, what a lot of us in the health coaching space are, tr- how we're trying to nurture our clients to understand their bodies and understand how to peacefully live in these things and take care of them uh, with love and respect for a change. Um, it's just, it's, there's so much to take away from this episode. And I'm really, I'm really grateful, uh, Monica, to have had you on and to teach us your, your methodology. It's been really nice. Well, if, if your listeners would like an opportunity to see these five principles kind of in action Mm -hmm. once a year, I do a coaching challenge in which I partner up with coaches that want to work together. And we do one of these 30 day challenges with our own folks, but we do it together. And it's really fun uh, way for us to collaborate with, with other coaches. It offers coaches a way to kind of engage their communities and, and their audiences and give them some programming without having to design and deliver a program. It's also a really nice opportunity to showcase your talents and your expertise in a wider circle. Oh. So, and it's coming up in March. And based only on this conversation, I would love to, um, to meet more of the folks, you know, that you are reaching and you are working with and, and to have a chance to actually work together on some of this stuff, because it's really fun. So if they are interested, if listeners are interested in finding out more about that, I have it all described at nutritionovereasy.com slash challenge. And this is just for the coaches. This is not the forward-facing thing for the participants. This is just for coaches who might want to partner up and do this together. Um, And if you do reach out, make sure that I know that you're from Health Coach Radio. Oh my gosh, that's so great. Yeah, what a wonderful offer. Yeah. I love that. And especially helpful for for coaches that are still struggling with building their signature program. There's a lot of tools out there, but what a phenomenal way to literally experience what a well-done program can feel like and, and having to a certain degree, collaboratively building better experiences for themselves, gaining more experience in terms of just the intricacies of this and what it takes to build a business like yours. I think that's awesome. Yeah. And it's, it's really fun just to have the coaches all in a room kind of co-coaching and bouncing Mm -hmm. off of each other. I think we all learn a lot about it. And it also just brings a sort of a bigger, more diverse community together to do this, which, Mm -hmm. which is always uh, fun people of all different ages and from all different parts of the country. And yeah, I really look forward to it. It's a lot of fun. You know, it just, it just makes me think like there's such an opportunity at this point in the, at this point in the game in health coaching, nutrition, coaching, everything to be truly collaborative. And instead Mm -hmm. of feeling like you have to reinvent the wheel and, and to Laura's point, create your own thing, like grab this, you know, training program from this awesome fitness influencer. We've got this great behavior change program here. You know, maybe I've got my area of expertise, but we're going to, we're going to put all this together into one mega program and leverage amazing resources that are already out there. I, I think that's just a really cool opportunity that's up and coming. There's tons of programs already built. And as a coach, you could build a practice where you're leveraging other people's stuff and having these collaborative relationships. 
Yeah. And you see what works and you decide what you want to build into your programs. But yeah, I don't think we need to be worried about guarding our yeah. little nuts. I think we all have so much more to gain mm -hmm. from collaborating, cross-pollinating and, uh, and, and sharing our energy and our expertise and, and all of that than we do from all trying to carve out our own little, yeah. you know, inviolable okay. corner of the, of the universe. So this is also more fun. Yeah. Growth mindset, right? Health coaching is growing, guys. I mean, I, I I don't know how many times I said, if I if if like going back ten years, that none of this stuff was around. None of these opportunities existed. None of these programs were around. Yours was, or yours was starting. <laughs> but there aren't. Oh, like, you know. But but really, there's so much more available now, and the the trajectory of the growth is just getting steeper. Like if mm. you've ever wished that you've timed a career opportunity perfectly, mm. or I mean, now's it, you know, now's it. So, you know, stay with it because it's there. And I, and I encourage anyone listening to give your offer a try. I think what a great offer. So thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. It was great talking with you both. I really enjoyed our conversation and I got a lot out of it. Me too. Likewise. Thank you so much. This podcast was brought to you by Primal Health Coach Institute. To learn more about how to become a successful health coach, get in touch with us by visiting primalhealthcoach.com forward slash call. Or if you're already a successful health coach, practitioner, influencer, or thought leader with a thriving business and an interesting story, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us at hello at primalhealthcoach.com and let us know why we need to interview you for Health Coach Radio. Thanks for listening.